right. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Brew Pierce, the company's of Visionation. We report on climate change issues uh, and solutions. Uh, I think it would be quite interesting to, uh, to have some idea of our audience. Just a quick survey. Who do we have in the audience who is, uh, first of all, an out and out denier of anything to do with climate change, if anybody? Who do we have who is in the environmental sector from the point of view of uh, renewable energy, for instance? Okay. Um, members of the public who are, are just curious. Okay. Uh, anybody who would regard themselves to be a real expert in the field? Three. And anybody that knows absolutely nothing about it? Okay. Uh, do we have anybody here who considers that it is not a problem to consider for at least 50 years? Do we have anybody here who is seriously concerned about what's happening in the next five years? I think we have a flavour. Okay, well it's now down to me to introduce uh, Professor Guy McPherson, a professor from the University of Arizona. And with him tonight is John Nissen, who is the chair of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. So Guy is going to make his presentation first, followed by John, and then we will try and have a really interactive debate about what we've heard. So uh, without further ado, Guy, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Bru, and thanks especially to all of you for making the appearance. I'd like to start with an asteroid, but you already know. Sometimes I ask people if they want to know if there's an asteroid coming, but almost everybody raised their hand about the five-year thing. So you're here because you know about the asteroid. And, and I, I think we're too late. I think the asteroid is already here. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is perhaps the most conservative scientific body on the planet. In their fifth assessment, officially released last year but heavily leaked beginning as early as September the year before, the IPCC concluded that global warming is irreversible in the absence of massive geoengineering of the atmosphere's chemistry. An approach, correctly in my view, called fantasy technology by truth out a few months later. There have been no humans on Earth at 3.3 degrees or higher baseline in the past. The greatest temperature experienced by humans was during the Eemian, when global average temperature was about 3.2 degrees above baseline. Baseline is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, about 1750 when we started burning fossil fuels at scale, at large scale. We're headed for a global average temperature above three and a half degrees in the very near term. And with apologies for the goofy cartoon, but I'm kind of a goofy cartoon sort of guy. The analog here is human body temperature is normal or what we'll call baseline at about 36.6 degrees. We add 3.5 to that, we're at 40.1. And the human life ends shortly thereafter. We can't survive 40.1 degrees centigrade body temperature for very long. And that's where we're headed as a planet, is that kind of temperature. We will not go extinct because we're not clever, we're unbelievably clever. But rather because we're human animals. And like other animals and other plants, we require habitat. We could very well run ourselves out of habitat. Indeed, even the slow rise in global average temperature so far is exceeding the ability of organisms to keep up with that slow rate of change by 10,000 times. Plants lag behind the current slow rise in temperature by a factor of 10,000. So, it's not that we aren't clever, it's that plants and native animals and all those things we depend upon for our very lives can't keep up. If the plants can't keep up, we run out of plants. And without plants, we all die. Because food is really handy. I'm going to bracket how quickly I think we could experience human extinction on planet Earth. And I'll start with a scenario that has all humans gone in about, or rather all habitat for humans gone, in about 18 months, and then consider that we might instead have a couple of decades. 
if the collapse of industrial civilization, which is underway and has been underway for at least 15 years, is complete this year, and I'm not making a prediction here, I'm not saying it will be, I'm suggesting that it could be, that will cause global average temperature to rise by 1.2 plus or minus 0.2 degrees, according to a paper by James Hansen and colleagues from 2011. Two subsequent papers published in the Refereed Journal literature indicate that this paper is very conservative, with the latest paper indicating only a 35% reduction in particulates, reflective particulates in the atmosphere could cause a one degree centigrade temperature rise. So I think it's quite conservative to conclude that when industrial civilization collapses, temperature will rise to 1.4 degrees above its current level. The reason for that is industrial activity constantly puts reflective particles into the atmosphere, most notably sulfates from burning high sulfur coal. They constantly fall out of the atmosphere too. And it takes only a few days from when they're put up until they fall out. So in, unless we keep putting sulfates into the atmosphere and other reflective particles, the umbrella goes away. And then the planet is subject to incoming solar radiation that will cause global average temperature to rise by at least 1.4 degrees. In addition, when that happens, and it certainly will happen, it's only a question of when. We can't sustain the unsustainable forever, and this is the most unsustainable civilization in human history so far. We rely completely upon ready access to inexpensive fossil fuels, and that's going away. So if that happens, when that happens, in less than, say, 50 or 60 years, the time required to decommission the nuclear power plants on the planet, of which there are more than 440, then we have the catastrophic meltdown of the world's nuclear facilities as well. Because without money being of some value, people aren't going to go to work. Without grid-tied electricity, the nuclear facilities melt down. So without human input at a pretty intensive scale and grid-tied electricity, the cooling ponds evaporate all their water, and the 1,200 cooling ponds filled with spent fuel rods produce the kinds of fires this planet has never seen. Now because I'm an optimist, I want to talk about climate change instead of the really nasty stuff, so I'm going to go back to that. Natalia Shikova, who has conducted field research in the Arctic Ocean for about the last 10 years, has concluded that a 50 gigaton burst of methane, rapid release of methane, is quote, highly possible at any time. Indeed, it appears that we're headed for an ice-free Arctic within the next year or two. It could happen this year, especially if industrial civilization falls and we experience that rapid warming associated with the lack of sulfate and other reflective particles umbrella. So that could happen this year as well. As early as September, we could have an ice-free Arctic. If we have an ice-free Arctic, which has never happened in human history, then I see no way to keep that 50 gigaton burst of methane buried beneath the sea. So if we tack on the 0.85 degrees centigrade above baseline that we are right now, baseline again being the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, add onto that the 1.4 from the collapse of industrial civilization, which I think is a conservative figure, and the 1.3, another conservative figure associated with the first, but almost certainly not the last, 50 gigaton burst of methane, then we're at 3.55, about a third of a degree higher than ever experienced by humans in the past with more than 75% of the heating occurring in a span of about a year and a half. It takes about a year for methane to circulate around the planet. So whereas habitat would disappear first in the northern hemisphere, it would take about a year for the heating to impact the entire globe. That said, the official consensus amongst climate scientists in 2008 anyway, was that we will require a global average temperature four degrees above baseline before humans go extinct. That was the scientific consensus in 2008 as re reported by Oliver Tickell in The Guardian. But now that 4C is locked in, climate scientists are backpedaling in a big way so that within the last seven years, 
the scientific consensus seems to be moving. As the goalposts move, apparently 4C is no longer a problem, even though global warming is outstripping the ability of plants, which we sort of need for our own survival, by a factor of 10,000, which would be accelerated by more than 250,000 if we get that collapse of industrial civilization and the burst of methane coming out of the Arctic. Still, climate scientists say it's four, maybe five degrees that humans can't survive. But we have to bear in mind that most climate scientists are not biologists and certainly not ecologists, so they don't necessarily have the perspective of humans as animals as one more species that is, of course, going to go extinct. I want to talk briefly about one of many irreversible self-reinforcing feedback loops on the climate front. And the one I'm going to address is methane released from the Arctic Ocean, occurring from the relatively shallow subsea permafrost and from methane hydrates or clathrates. The hydrates or clathrates are chemical cages around CH4, CH4 being methane, you know it as natural gas that you use to heat water and sometimes heat your house. And when the, when the clathrate gets warm enough, it breaks and the methane is released into the water column or into the atmosphere. It, the rapid release of methane from the Arctic Ocean was initially reported in the Referee Journal literature nearly six years ago and subsequently has been reported by several sources. It took about three years before a paper in Global Policy pointed out that this is one of several self-reinforcing feedback loops and that the process is irreversible, indicating the conservative nature of science. So it took three years after the initial paper came out before a guy named Michael Jennings at the University of Idaho in Global Policy pointed out that there's a whole lot more going on than just methane and that it's gone exponential, which is problematic. By July 2013, according to the National Aeronautic and Space Administration of the United States' CARVE project, there were methane plumes in the Arctic Ocean up to 150 kilometers across. Observed with satellites, so this is real-time measurements, these are not models, methane plumes up to 150 kilometers across. That's big. If you're in a sailing ship and you're in the middle of that plume, as far as you can see in every direction, the sea appears to be boiling as the methane is being released. Earth is within 1% of the uninhabitable zone, according to a paper from a couple of years ago in the Astrophysical Journal. So we just thought we were right here in the middle of the green zone, the Goldilocks zone. So only a couple of years ago we just did we discover that Earth is right at the inner edge of the habitable zone. And so it could be, given the proximity of Earth to the Sun, that a relatively minor change in atmospheric chemistry could trigger events that would cause a Venus-style event with the oceans boiling off and the atmosphere becoming much different than the one we have now, almost certainly incapable of supporting life for very long. Well, as it turns out, we haven't made minor changes in atmospheric chemistry to the Earth. We've made major changes, with carbon dioxide increased by more than 40% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and methane increasing more than 250% in that same period of time. Indeed, Sam Carana projects just that sort of event with methane going exponential. And somebody asked me the other day, some guy sitting right in the front row raises his question as soon as I got finished speaking, and he said, so you haven't been keeping up with the literature, apparently. And I'm like, I'm your keep up with the literature climate guy. What are you talking about? And he says, well, that figure is old. I said, it's from like four months ago. And he said, yeah, within two weeks. Have you not been keeping up? Within two weeks. We have measurements now showing methane in 2015. This only goes up to 2014. 2015, the measurements are right there, literally off this chart, indicating that this is not nearly a steep enough line. So things are worse than I thought, than I knew. And so Sam Crana projects temperature to rise along with methane and has the oceans boiling off before the turn of the next century. This is one of many self-reinforcing feedback loops, 47 that I know about so far. 
I'm talking about methane because it's the one that was reported first in the journal literature. And so we know the most about that one. These other ones include, for example, peat moss in the world's boreal forests, essentially sublimating, going from solid form to gaseous form in a very short period of time, thereby kicking more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, making it warmer and drier in the boreal forest, which causes more peat to decompose rapidly and kick more carbon into the atmosphere. Another good example of a self-reinforcing feedback loop is the land permafrost, which at this point we might as well call permamelt because it's all going away so very rapidly. Land-based permafrost is melting away and releasing methane at the same time methane is, is being emitted from beneath the Arctic Ocean, from the Ring of Fire, especially around New Zealand, from the Atlantic coast off the northeastern United States, from the Pacific coast off the northwestern United States, and so on. So methane is popping up all over now, and including on land and from the sea. Climate scientist Paul Beckwith, who works at the University of Ottawa in Canada, and who's a member of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, in late November of last year, concluded that we have triggered a five to six degree temperature increase global average within 10 or 20 years. Again, bear in mind that the relatively slow rate of global average warming so far has outstripped the ability of plants to keep up by a factor of 10,000 times. And we're talking about a very rapid acceleration. Paul also contemplated the idea of a 10 or 11 degree temperature rise within that same period of time. And I don't see any way for humans to survive even a five or six degree temperature rise in that short period of time, given that we depend upon a living planet to survive. Just a few more snippets of data. According to a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences from more than six years ago, climate change is irreversible for at least the next thousand years. Based on carbon dioxide alone, the heating associated with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere today is locked in for at least the next thousand years. International Energy Agency predicts up to a six degree temperature rise by 2050. That's based on carbon dioxide only. And that makes a lot of sense because at current levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we can expect up to a 23 meter sea level rise and at least six sea rise in temperature. That's based on carbon dioxide alone. As reported in Climatic Change initially and subsequently in a couple of other papers, only complete collapse of civilization prevents runaway climate change. And now we know that complete collapse of industrial civilization causes that at least 1.4 C temperature rise in a very short period of time. And finally, uh, according to a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, there was a five degree temperature rise during a span of only 13 years, 55 million years ago, which triggered a relatively minor extinction event. It wasn't a great extinction event. For example, the sixth great extinction that we're in right now. It was a relatively minor extinction event compared to that, produced by methane release. And that's apparently what caused this 5C temperature rise in 13 years. The current great extinction event, the sixth on the planet, is proceeding more rapidly than any other. Uh, species are, are being driven to extinction at the rate of 150 to 200 species per day. In addition, the carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere exceeds the rate that occurred during the Great Dying 252 million years ago, when more than 90% of the species on the planet were lost in a relatively short period of time in, in what is considered the greatest extinction event pre-humans. So just a few snippets there to brighten your day. I want to wrap up by talking about some of that fantasy technology reported in Truth Out from April of last year. According to a paper in Earth System Dynamics, these are all refereed journal articles. Uh, climate geoengineering cannot simply be used to undo global warming. We can't just engineer our way out of this mess. For every solution, there are myriad problems that arise. Solutions create those problems. Journal Geophysical Research tacks on in December 2013. Environmental research letters comes along again, attempts to reverse the impacts of global warming by injecting reflective particles into the atmosphere could make matters worse. 
And this is the most common approach to geoengineering, is to propose putting reflective particles into the atmosphere at a faster rate than we're already doing them through industrial activity. Environmental Research Letters has a paper, again, risk of abrupt and dangerous warming is inherent to large-scale implementation of SRM, or solar radiation management, again, putting those reflective particles into the atmosphere. And a nice summary comes from Nature Communications. Current schemes are likely to either be relatively useless or actually make things worse. So I think Farley Moat, who was not writing about this particular topic, but referring to the human condition generally, I, th I think he got it about right. We're under some gross misconception that we're a good species going somewhere important and that at the last minute we'll correct our errors and God will smile on us. It's delusion. Not only is it delusion, but the last minute was years ago. The last minute isn't at some point in the future. I've been hearing since I was a wee grandchild that if we didn't start fixing things on, on various environmental issues, we're going to be in real trouble. How come the clock always says three minutes till midnight? I think I know why. The clock is broken. The environmental clock is broken. I see no way that we will correct our errors and have God smile on us. The history of our species is similar to that of us as individuals. It's short. As individuals, as a species, we show up, we take a look around, we blink a few times, and that's it. <laughs> the end. Finally, everything mentioned that will occur in the future is already underway. Food and water shortages? Check. Already underway. Mass migrations? Perhaps you've read about the people from Northern Africa and the Middle East who are invading Europe or maybe the members of small island states in the South Pacific being allowed into New Zealand until last year it cost two million dollars or possession of one of a handful of rare skills to get into New Zealand. Now you just need to be from one of the islands that is losing all habitat for humans because of climate change. Five million people a year die early deaths because of climate change, mostly because of food and water shortages. Deadly disease spreading already underway. You only need to raise the low temperature for an area, the low temperature for the day. You only have to raise that by a degree or two to greatly increase biological activity. Lyme disease is spreading like wildfires. Speaking of wildfires, how about Siberia? Fires too big to control? Again, check, already underway. Storms that have the capacity to level cities. Anybody heard of the Philippines last year? Hurricane Sandy, Katrina. This has been going on for at least 10 years. It's always a problem for the future. Thank you all for your attention. I'll turn the mic over to John at this point. John, thank you very much. Good. Thank you. John Nissen is the chairman of the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. That's AMEG. AMEG uh, came to our attention at Visitation about four years ago. Uh, when we were looking into the climate situation. And we were, of course, frankly appalled to learn about what John had to say. And that led me to meeting with um, Professor Peter Wadhams uh, and David Wasdale, uh, all of whom are telling a similar story, but with a slight twist to it, in that this group of people still think that there may be things that we can do about it. And the Arctic Methane Emergency Group have been working very hard on the geoengineering sector, uh, looking for those solutions. So I'm going to ask John to uh, give his presentation and tell you what he thinks can be done, and then we'll debate it. Thank you. Um, this, this planet of ours is absolutely astonishing, amazing. Guys pointed out that so much about the plight of the, on the planet which we have You'll never have heard of, of any of this in the press. Uh, so I must thank you, uh, uh, Guy, for that. My, uh, my colleagues in AMEG and I agree with Guy that there's a planetary emergency and we've been uh, trying to tell everybody uh, that there's an emergency and we, we get completely blank uh, faces. Nobody wants to hear about it. Uh, in, in authority, all the experts are just in, in denial. 
uh, of, of this. Uh, it's extraordinarily difficult to get it through. And we're committed to four or five degrees this century, other things being equal. Uh, and it's an existential threat for civilization. Uh, a few humans may survive, but um, essentially the infrastructure, the way the modern civilization, the infrastructure will collapse, and it could collapse quite quickly. Uh, this brings the date of our downfall from the end of the century to mid mid century uh, on our present course. That's just from CO2. If you add the, the level of methane, the date comes closer. Um, there's no, there's been no public warning about this, and the focus of public debate has been almost entirely on CO2 emissions reduction. What people don't realise is that the legacy of CO2 already in the atmosphere is enough to almost guarantee a dangerous amount of uh, warming and associated climate change. Guy pointed out that if we did close everything down, uh, the SO2 that's causing cooling uh, of our planet very successfully is about, it's about half the global warming of CO2 is offset by sulfur dioxide emitted from coal-fired power stations. So cuts isn't going to be enough and try to clean up the atmosphere and remove uh, SO2 because it's thought to be a pollutant it will be absolutely cat catastrophic. So we mustn't do that. We must ca carry on burning coal uh, or better take the sulfur dioxide out of the coal plant and put it in the uh, stratosphere. If we did that, uh, we would cool uh, the whole planet very successfully. But I'm not, I'm not advocating that, I'm just pointing that out. Um, from our past uh, negligence, we're now committed to this climate change which threatens our, uh, our civilization. This is my favorite uh, cartoon of climate change picture of a house burning down with the people staying inside and only when the house is actually burnt down do they say the house is on fire. Well this is only too true isn't it? Anyhow let's call that the CO2 problem because we we also have the Arctic. The Arctic's been warming faster uh, than the rest of the planet um, or except Antarctica where the, the bits warming and the rest is cooling. My attention was brought to the Arctic thanks to uh, Peter Wadhams who's done a lot of research. You can see in the background is a, a submarine. He spent uh, decades persuading the Ministry of Defence to let him go in a submarine and measure the thickness of the ice and he noticed that the uh, uh, sea ice has been, thickness has been decreasing and he's looked at the condition of the sea ice this year and it, he says it could happen this year i.e. at the end of summer this year in September uh, the sea ice could practically disappear uh, from the ocean. It's very very bad uh, news. We've got the broken sea ice here. Basically you can see a lot of white stuff which reflects sunlight very effectively, 85% sunlight reflected. And dark stuff, that's the water, 90% of the sunlight goes into it, only to 10% reflected. The open water absorbs the sun heat and that goes into some depths and that acts as a heat storage and that storage heater helps to melt the, the ice the next year and you get a, um, a vicious cycle of warming and so this is how we get um, an exponential trend and we can see that exponential trend on that graph so that's really bad news. So uh, Peter Wadhams and our group have been wondering what, the, what on earth can we do about it? And we see the, the only way is to basically try and put the, the Arctic back in the, in the freezer. We've got to try and uh, keep the sea ice and cool the water flowing into the Arctic to encourage formation of the ice. Now, what are the consequences? So we've, we've also looked ahead uh, in the way that Guy has and said, well, what are the consequences? 
And there are three major consequences. We've talked about the methane, and you've already seen pictures of the plumes. There's a plume on the right. And you've got melting of the Greenland thing, as that's causing sea level rise, that's rising exponentially. And then the, the, the really new, relatively new thing in the last five or, or years or so is some work coming from Jennifer Francis at Rutgers uh, University uh, about the jet stream. It's affecting the weather, it's causing weather extremes to happen. We've got a, a stuck jet, jet stream. Uh, over the states, causing a, a drought in California. Now, if the Arctic continues warming, um, uh, we we get a um, we get a real problem. Okay, this is a kind of trend line on the food price. If you go on having unpredictable climate and climate extremes, floods and droughts and things, the cost of food goes up. And above a certain level, you get a crisis. A billion people are on the starvation line, and if you increase the price of food, they begin starving, and they riot. An example was the Arab Spring, and the, the Egyptian riot that started off was a food riot. A, a bread, you know, they wanted bread. And they blame the, they blame the economics and their government. If we carry on this trend, which is Arctic warming, with nothing to do with CO2, this is Arctic warming, uh, we could see the collapse of civilization by 2030, and I think I'm very much in agreement with Guy whether he sees it as being Arctic-specific or CO2 or methane. I don't mind. So, you may not be able to see, but it's a nighttime view of the Titanic sailing towards an iceberg, and it's got a caption about uh, rearranging the deck chairs should we accept the inevitability of the outcomes, should we be arranging the deck chairs for comfort and enjoy the band? Or should we be fighting tooth and nail to solve the problems as best we can? Because I want to bring hope. We have been looking at this, and we've got a fantastic engineer uh, on our group who, who's, uh, who's got some ideas of how to cool the Arctic. And basically, he uses the observations of uh, how clouds behave if you put um, very small particles uh, and seed the cloud with fine ones, you, you brighten the clouds, and that reflects more sunlight, significantly more sunlight off the clouds. They're brightened, and that darkens the surface on, on, uh, below. And if you do this over the Atlantic, North Atlantic, then the water that flows into the Arctic can be cooled, and you produce significant amount of cooling. Whether we can do quite enough to stop this because it's gone so far, we don't know. But at least we ought to be trying. And this poor man has been trying to get some funding. He, he can't get funding from any. He might have got some through the back door through Bill Gates, but apart from that. And the problem is that the, you know, the people who should be do, doing the authorities are denying that all this is happening. If they didn't deny it, uh, you know, this kind of thing uh, could be carrying on and we could be doing research. Now some other people coming up with ideas, we had some very recently, for thickening the ice in the Arctic. Now if we could thicken the ice, it would have to be done on a, a vast scale. You'd have to have lots, lots of pumps, perhaps a million, but you know, uh, spending a, a thousand pound each, that's a billion pounds, what's that compared to the saving civilization? We've got to take a common sense view to, of this. It is not happening. Uh, and why is it not happening? Because people are not taking it seriously. They're in denial. They're pretending it's not happening. And we're trying desperately to get through. Uh, we haven't found a way yet, but we, we continue trying. We hope somebody in authority will, will, will pick this up and run with it. We real, this is desperate need for leadership um, from somebody who will just take a common sense say, you know, What's the problem? What have you got to do? How much cooling power do you need? And we've done the calculation. We've, we've, we've worked out how, how much it needs. It's a fraction of a petawatt. Now, a petawatt is the kind of uh, power you get from a dub doubling of CO2. So we've got techniques that can achieve that kind of cooling power, and we're not using them. And we're talking about turning off the power stations as we're producing SO2, which is doing the, the cooling. And we could be putting this SO2 
in the atmosphere. It's not as if we're not already doing it. We're already putting SO2 into the stratosphere. And people say, oh gosh, we can't put any more. This is science fiction. It won't work. It'll, it'll have the reverse of, of, of what it's intended to. Rubbish. It's working. It's, it's doing it. It's cooling, the, it's cooling the planet. And we're ignoring that. I've got a Google alert on research and geoengineering. I've had about a thousand uh, responses on my alert. And I think there's only one or two which are slightly pro-geoengineering. It's all anti. It, 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 it's mad. If we can break out of this madness, and perhaps some of you can spread the word, we've got a hope. Let's start to get the discussion yeah. going. I mean, I'm keen to know, Guy, whether you feel that it's completely pointless doing this. Are the finances right not to be coming forward with research monies which we desperately mm. need? I think the madness is what we're doing already. I agree with the refereed journal literature indicating that civilization is a heat engine. The only way to turn that off is to turn off civilization. To maintain civilization is to willingly accept the extinction of 150 to 200 species every day, based on a conservative report now nearly five years old by the United Nations. But so, so I think civilization lies at the root of many of our problems, including climate change. So in the spirit of Hippocrates, first do no harm. But have I, you, I understand that people love civilization. I get that. Have you not just told us though that if we switch off civilization, we're going to get rapid heating and then go directly into, into Armageddon? I think that humans have already guaranteed their own extinction. But we have not guaranteed the extinction of every other species on the planet. That's clearly one of the goals of industrial civilization, is to kill everything. <laughs> I don't think it's about us. The universe is 13.8 billion years old. Our species, about 200,000. If I stretch out my arms both ways, and that represents the, the time of the universe, 13.8 billion years, then the human experience is the last few cells on the end of my middle finger. We just showed up, we think it's all about us. Civilization has been around for a few thousand years, we think it's the most important thing ever. But Guy, are we not a really important part of that evolutionary process and are we not potentially the route to step off this planet and to move on? Because the Earth has a finite end to it, the Sun will eventually envelop it. And if, if we disappear, will there be time for intelligent species to re-evolve uh, and for us to potentially move on? You're assuming we're, in we're an intelligent species? Well, I, I think we have the consciousness of the planet. We are blessed with awareness. We understand the science and see what's going on. We actually understand our own demise or the demise that's coming. Or do you feel that, hey, it's just better that we go on as a meal? I think... Um Judging other species as lesser is one of the factors that got us into this mess. Again, we see ourselves as superior. Uh, I think we gave ourselves the wrong name. Homo sapiens means the wise ape. How about Homo calidus, the clever ape, instead? We're really very clever. I don't think it's about us. If we had wisdom, I think we wouldn't have been doing things the way we've been doing them for the last several thousand years. I don't think the fight is any longer on behalf of humans, in other words. According to Edward O. Wilson, conservation biologist at, at Harvard University, it only takes 10 million years after a great extinction event for the planet to become vibrant and alive again. So I'm a big fan of not driving to extinction 150 to 200 species every day. Yeah, well, I, 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 one wouldn't accept it, and I'm sure John, the Arctic Methane Emergency Group, wouldn't. But John, what's your response to that? Well, I, I think we've got a chance. I think we are, are intelligent, and uh, we've got amazing engineering talent. And we look at the engineering possibilities, and, okay, if that's got to be done, could we do it? And it, it looks as if we can. And I go along to geoengineering events and most of the uh, invited speakers are talking about geoengineering 
uh, as some distant thing and it will never, probably never be used 30, 40 years perhaps. They don't really live on the planet, they're, they're in an ivory tower. Um, but there are a few of us, um, a few engineers, really bright people who've got good, really good ideas. There was a woman who appeared who, who's got a, a way of brightening snow and keeping it for longer. You could fl fly uh, across Siberia and, and spray snow and pick up water from lakes and create snow. There are all sorts of things one could do. Um, it's just a matter of, of having a, a, a really good organization focused on solving the problem that we have, which is the, the Arctic sea ice disappearing. Uh, that's the Arctic, that's the, the Arctic problem. Focus on that and for heaven's sake get going on removing CO2 from the atmosphere. I mean that's a possible thing to do. There are all sorts of ideas and they, they don't all cost a bomb. bomb. You, you can have chemical trees that mimic uh, photosynthesis, but it's much better to grow more plants and heat them pyrolytically so you get charcoal and put the charcoal in the ground uh, to improve the fertility of the soil, that's called biochar. Uh, you could do that on a massive extent and, and then draw down uh, a lot of CO2. Now, how do you pay for it? Well, you put a, uh, a carbon tax on the carbon that's being taken out of the ground. BP is already anticipating a 20% uh, uh, kind of carbon tax. They've built it into their business model. They're expecting there to be a carbon tax. <laughs> the thing is soluble, but where are the people, where are the governments doing, attempting to do the solution? As you say, you rather doubt whether we are homo sapiens. If we were Martians looking at this earth and seeing what, it, it would be perfectly obvious what we should be doing. You know, look, they're letting the sea ice disappear. For heaven's sake, why didn't they use some of their technology to keep it? Okay. You uh, know, they're putting CO2. You know, I'm imagining myself looking from Mars onto the Earth. Great point. Yeah. John, let, let me stop it there and let's take some questions. Firstly, just a point, which is that if civilization goes, then I don't see how natural wildlife will reassert itself because, as you point out, the 400 odd nuclear reactors will melt down and the work of Dr. Tim Musso suggests that these are sterilizing events, the tree decay and growth has been stopped which suggests the microbes are gone. My question is, if the long-awaited El Nino ha happens this year, what impact is that going to have on global climate? Well, Gen Jennifer Francis, uh, who's advising us on the jet stream behaviour, is, is extremely worried. She doesn't, she doesn't know which way it'll affect. The reason why the jet stream is wandering is because the temperature uh, in the um, tropics has risen less uh, than it has in the Arctic. So the gradient, temperature gradient, is reduced and that me means that the jet stream which holds binds the things together is meandering more. So, there's just a possibility it might not, not make as, as much change uh, yeah. as one fears. But on the other hand, if it does bring some serious disasters, it might make people wake up, which perhaps would be a good thing. Next question, please. You've talked about CO2 and you mentioned biochar, and I was thinking, you know, why aren't we growing far more uh, forests rather than cutting them down? But that will answer the CO2 question, but the methane one is far more, from what you're saying, far more important and far more urgent. How are we going to stop the methane, uh, or how do we get it out of the uh, air once it's in the air? At the moment, most of the methane, which is caused the 250% two, increase, is, is as a result of industrial activity. A lot of it is fugitive methane, that can be cleared up. A lot of it's coming from wetlands. And what you can do is you can uh, promote uh, uh, diatoms in wetlands and that uh, encourages the digestion of, of methane conversion into CO2. So you can do that on a massive scale. And in the Arctic, uh, is, is the cooling of the Arctic 
yeah, and putting this sea ice cover cap on is, is brilliant. Okay, we're going to have to move fast. Your question, please. My name is Roger Lambert, and I did write to you, Guy, a couple of years ago, and you did reply to me, so thank you very much for that. Uh, I've got a science background, uh, and I've come to the same conclusions that you have, almost identical time scales. Can I just say how noble it is, I think, for a, for a professor to actually stand up and say what these repercussions really are going to mean? Because it seems to me that most climate scientists know the facts, like you do, but won't admit what the actual outcome will be. And my question to you, is this the end of the Gulf Stream? The jet stream from Paul Beckwith's uh, work that I saw yesterday, it's just broken up. It was wavy, now it's broken. The only thing I would say about geoengineering, to me, is like a lot of men, a lot of people sitting around in a circle on the Titanic saying, how do we change the course of this ship when they just hit the iceberg? Thank you for your kind comment. Predictions are difficult, especially about the future. So I don't think we can know if the thermohaline conveyor belt, the Gulf Stream, has stopped or reversed course at this point. Could be, could be that it has. The most recent observation suggests that it has. This has happened at least six times in planetary history. So it would hard, hardly be unprecedented. Um, I think we don't have enough data to know that yet. Um, whether that event will produce conditions of extreme cold and whether that will counter the methane and the carbon dioxide remains to be seen as well. So I'm sorry to be all squirrely and not answering your question, but I just don't know enough to say. Okay. Do we have another question? So we've had quite a lot of discussion about whether or not we should be trying to do things about putting particles into the atmosphere to reduce or give us a bit of a chance of potentially reducing the rate of climate change or maybe reverse it. Um, although I'm not sure either of you has argued that that would actually reverse it. Um, but it seems like it's fairly likely that we're heading towards a very major amount of climate change. What does that actually mean for how we live our lives and how we think about the future and how we're all responding to that, sitting here listening to this story that the whole of humanity might be extinct in 10, 20, 30 years' time? I'm not going to suddenly leave this lecture theatre and create geoengineering to happen in the a Arctic. I'm going to go home and be in my house and think about the work that I'm going to do over the next couple of weeks. And I think it's really important that we just kind of think about that emotional side. Let me take that forward, because that seems to be the question here. And um, just out of interest's sake, can we have a show of hands for all those that think, sod it, there's nothing we can do, uh, just let it all come and enjoy ourselves now. So all those that think that, raise your hands. Uh, all right, sod it, I'm going to have a good time. Raise your hands. Uh, all right, it's a pretty small minority. We've got, we've got seven or eight hands up. Those that think we should all be doing absolutely everything we can to get our leaders to swing into action and throw money at this problem. I still think it's a double question. I think yeah. we all come to the conclusion that we think we've had it, but we should not stop doing what we should have to do. We, we all know this. And I think on the geoengineering thing, I think the question you ask, why do the governments not, um, not help this, it, is essentially because people don't trust it. They don't trust us meddling. We've already meddled enough in what we do. Um, some of you may have followed Professor Lovelock in the past, or be aware of him, or know of him, James Lovelock. Now, one of the things he said was that if we're going to stop global warming, we have to build, build more nuclear reactors. Now, of course, to all us environmentalists, that sounds like a totally absurd course of action. But if you, if you actually think it through, it, it is logical. I mean, I'm anti-nuclear, as it happens, so uh, I didn't like that idea. But it's still, nevertheless, what we're having to consider is, is some drastic measures in order to try and attempt to turn this around. I think we haven't got a chance. Okay, so not many of us feel we have a chance. Um, Jim Lovelock set me on this course, and um, he said, let the biosphere recapture the carbon for us. Okay, Guy, um, you, you've talked about living a life of excellence, and the lady back there was saying, how are we going to respond as individuals? 
you haven't really mentioned the life of excellence and that's one of the, the bits of your talk that i really like can you have two minutes on that sure good question just for <laughs> clarification i say pursue a life of excellence i don't think we're capable of living a life of excellence it's a <laughs> it's a, it's an un, unreachable goal that said, I think we should pursue what we love and pursue excellence, whatever that means to us. I have never, nor would I ever, advocate rolling over and dying. Action, as Edward Abbey pointed out, is the antidote to despair. Not only that, but I believe we should take the right actions and not be attached to the outcome. So, for me, pursuing a life of excellence is asking questions of this culture and pointing out the absurdity of it all. The human hubris that goes along with thinking we can fix every problem when in fact every fix we've applied in the last few thousand years has created more problems. So let's, let's do no harm. Let's get over our addiction to electricity at any and every cost, I including using nuclear power to boil water. The absurdity is profound. Let's pursue what we love and pursue excellence, whatever that means to us. I think that's legitimate, reasonable advice, regardless of whether we live to be 100 or 117 or 25. Okay, guys, thank you very much. We, we really have run out of time, unfortunately, I'm afraid. Um, um, leaves me to thank Guy McPherson very much indeed, and uh, John Nissen, and uh, for all of you for coming. Thank you very much.